Shalom, brothers and sisters. So I want to take you down an interesting uh, little story at the moment that I found. Something that the Lord revealed to me. So if I had to ask you, we've all got favorites in the Bible and we'll, we'll sit and discuss sometimes who you're looking forward to meet once we get up there. And, and obviously we've all got those names. So And then the question I'd have for you is, if you had to pick three people in the Bible that really stand out for God, who would it be? And think about that for a second. Who would be on that list of the three people that in your mind would stand out for God? And there is actually three people mentioned by name, by God, that stand out for him. And one of the ones on my list that I thought would definitely be on that list that would stand out for God would be Moses. Not on God's list. Another one that would come up immediately for me would be Elijah. Not on God's list. Did you even know there's a list of three people that he mentions regularly as an example? If you turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 12 to 20. Let's just read and start there. The word of the Lord came again to me saying, Son of man, when a land sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply of bread, send famine on it, and cut off man and beast from it. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. If I cause wild beasts to pass through the land and they empty it and make it so desolate that no man may pass through because of the beasts, even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters only they would be delivered and the land would be desolate. Or if I bring a sword on that land and say, sword, go through the land, and I cut off man and beast from it, even though these three men were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither sons nor daughters, but only they themselves would be delivered. Or if I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury on it in blood and cut off from it man and beast, even though Noah, Daniel and Job were in it, as I live, says the Lord God, they would deliver neither son nor daughter, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. So amazing piece of scripture right there. And for me, the big thing that jumped out here is that God is specifying three people specifically. Noah, Daniel, and Job as an example. Not Moses, not Elijah, not Abraham, not anybody else. These three he uses as an example. So if we dive into it, let's look at Noah first. In referencing the flood, Peter mentions Noah as a preacher of righteousness. 2 Peter 2 verse 5. This is the same thing that God attributes to this, these three men. They would only deliver themselves by their righteousness. Hebrews 11 verse 7 reads, By faith... Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. Genesis 6 verse 9 is where it lists him the first time and says, This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man perfect in his generations. Noah walked 
with God. Now, just is another word for righteousness, seeking rightness with God, living correctly, living for the Lord. He walked with God. It's even a bigger acclaim and title for me to be known as one who walked with God, not against God, not contrary to God, not after him, after a long gap, with God together, seeking to draw closer to him all the time in deeper intimacy and knowledge of his Lord. That is what he was in his generation. And he lived in a generation much as we do today. And that is why the New Testament says, as in the days of Noah and Lot, so will it be in the time of the end. He lived in a generation of evil and darkness and despicable things that should never have happened. Abominations abounded and people rallied against God. And yet he stood proudly, openly speaking for God and preaching and calling out to people. For many, many years. And he is counted as a man of righteousness. The next person we have mentioned by name is Daniel. Now Daniel, let's give you some history. The northern kingdom fell to Assyria in about 722 BC. The southern kingdom of Judah had ended too, conquered in about 605 BC. Finally destroyed by the armies of Babylon in 587 BC. Daniel, as a young man, a teenager really, had been exiled or deported in 605 BC along with many other youths from royal and noble families. This is what they did when they conquered countries. And he would be trained to serve in the king's palace in Babylon. Daniel chooses not to defile himself with the king's food upon his arrival in Babylon. The food would have rendered him ceremonially unclean according to Torah, Daniel 1 verse 8. And toward the end of his life, he continues to pray to God and not the king, even though it puts him in danger, Daniel 6 verse 13. When his political opponents try and get dirt on him, right, which they do to this day still, they try and get dirt on their opponents, they find nothing. That is the righteous life he is living for God. Their only option was to make it illegal to obey God. Daniel 6 verse 4 to 5. So he lived such a righteous life and so faithfully for God that his opponents in politics could not find any dirt on him. Now, how many people could say that today? Living that righteously for God. Daniel was taken to Babylon as a young man, right? So as a teenager, before even puberty. So let's say between 10 and 18 years old. The Babylonian captivity lasted 70 years, which puts Daniel in his 80s, plus minus, at the beginning of Darius' reign in Daniel chapter 6. And this is when the lion's den episode takes place. So that gives you perspective of not a young man or a man in the strength of his life being lowered into the lion's pit, but an old man who should be respected and revered. 70, 80 years old, dropped into a pit full of lions. And even then, standing on God's promises and God and who he is. Living righteously. Daniel's also the one that receives amazing dreams and visions and and snippets of the future, and seals up the words for the end time, which we are now unlocking. He talks about the 70 weeks for Israel, which we are now understanding, and we are now approaching the 70th week. Daniel also had the amazing thing of being able to give them the exact time frame. If they had read Daniel properly, they would have been waiting for Jesus when he arrived, because it works out so mathematically perfectly. To when Messiah came the first time. And not just that. It gives us a glimpse to the final week. Here. Where we are in 2024. At the end of mankind. So Daniel understandably. One of these three. That lived righteously. That God mentions by name. Then Job. Our third candidate. If we just start in Job 1 verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz. Whose name was Job. And that man 
was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. A righteous man. That's what he was, a righteous man. Blameless and upright, a God-fearer, one who turns from evil. In short, Job was blameless and upright in that he was a man with integrity who trusted in God as his Redeemer. No matter what. Job 19 verse 25 to 27 is one of two of my favorite scriptures in the book of Job. And you should really read the book of Job. It's beautiful. It's an amazing revealing scriptures. Job 19 verse 25 to 27. For I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. He is talking about the revelation that the Redeemer, Jesus Christ, lives and will stand at last on the earth many years ahead of him and after my skin is destroyed this i know that in my flesh i shall see god after he's died he will have a new body and he will see god do you see the connections here and the understanding this man of righteousness had whom I shall see for myself, and my eye shall behold, and not another, how my heart yearns within me. I feel the same. My heart yearns to be with Jesus again, to be back in his arms, and never to leave again. My heart yearns as Job's heart yearned for that moment. Job 13 verse 15 to 16 says the following. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for a hypocrite could not come before him. Though he slay me, yet will I serve the Lord. Can you say that? Are you at that place with the Lord or are you still at the, it better go well or I'm going to be angry with God stage. You should be at the place where we love him so much. Though he appear now and slay me, yet will I trust in him. Yet will I serve the Lord. He shall be my salvation, my Yeshua. Hebrews 12 verse 1 to 3. And that's when I want to really bring these three men together for you in. These three men that stand out that God uses to show us righteousness. Job, David, Noah. If we go to Hebrews 12 verse 1 to 3, it says this. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. So no matter how hard it becomes, how difficult it becomes, whatever trials and tribulations the enemy wishes to heap up in front of us, we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author of and finisher of our faith, who has endured so much more than we ever could even imagine or think. And we will run this race, and we will strive to be righteous in His eyes, and we get our righteousness from Jesus Christ through what He did on the cross. We cannot earn that. It was given to us as a gift, but because we love God and we seek 
Him, with all that is within us, we live righteously before our God. We shun evil and sin. We put those things away from us and we walk as he showed us how to walk. The way, the truth and the life. And we shine that light into the darkness so that we can reach more people in the time that we have left. So I challenge you. Be like these men, highlighted by God, men of righteousness, in evil generations that looked to God and sought to please Him and live for Him and love Him above all, always. It's all about Jesus. Shalom.